In this lecture, we'll be talking about the death of Tiberius and then the reigns of Caligula and Claudius. We'll begin by looking at the death and legacy of Tiberius and then turn to the rise of Caligula and his reign, ending with his assassination and his succession by Claudius. And then finally, we'll conclude with Claudius's reign as princeps. So Tiberius. As we talked about in the previous lecture, Tiberius spent the majority of his time away from Rome in Capri. It's clear that he was quite different from his adopted father, Augustus. He didn't share Augustus's sense of how to achieve and maintain popularity. He was not particularly interested in cultivating the loyalty, the love of the people. He also seems to have lacked ambition. He, in many ways, was the accidental princeps. He didn't want to become princeps, and he only became princeps because all of Augustus's other successors had died previously. And it's clear that he lacked vision, and perhaps Augustus even saw this in Tiberius. Tiberius was a great military man, but wasn't really cut out to rule an empire. He left Rome, he wasn't interested in being in Rome, the problem with this was that it allowed other people to exercise power in his absence, and that power was often abused, particularly by Sejanus and some of the Senate. On the plus side, Tiberius left the Roman treasury in extremely good shape. Part of this was simply the fact that he was not spending great sums of money on games. He wasn't hosting beast hunts in the amphitheater. He wasn't in, in indulging in new building projects the way that Augustus was. And so whereas he had inherited an empire and a treasury that was somewhat deplete after Augustus's orgy of building projects, Tiberius shores things up. He also consolidated Rome's holdings. So Augustus had really expanded the empire as far as it could go at that time. And Tiberius takes the position of consolidation rather than expansion. He used military force when it was necessary, but like Augustus, used it only to maintain peace and preferred diplomacy whenever possible. Tiberius's reputation posthumously was pretty seriously blackened by his connection to treason trials. So it's not clear that he condoned these, that he even was entirely aware of how many were going on in Rome. But certainly under Tiberius, in his reign, there was an explosion of these treason trials, maestas in Latin. And roughly what this was, was just an accusation that someone would raise that somebody had plotted against the empire, um, plotted against the emperor himself um, or the emperor's family. It was the kind of charge that was easy to levy and the levels of proof that were required were not extremely high, and so in all likelihood a lot of very innocent people were put to death under these treason trials. So this was something that, that really blackened Tiberius's reputation posthumously, as did the fact that he was spent most of his time in withdrawal from Rome, living in Capri. And this gave rise to accusations that he was off in Capri having one big party, that it was a big orgy, and that he was a sociopath. There are stories that he would throw slaves off of his cliffs um, down into the Bay of Naples just for entertainment or because he was angry about something. And he's remembered by ancient historians, particularly Tacitus, as something of a paranoid sociopath. How much this is, is connected to reality is really an open question. It's almost certainly not that closely connected and reflects rather Tiberius's or uh, Tacitus's dislike of Tiberius. There are a couple of different stories about Tiberius's death. Um, in the first one, he just dies of natural causes. That's the more likely version of events. But in a second one, he's ill. And in fact, it's the Praetorian prefect Macro who had replaced Sejanus who smothers him. And so in the image that just came up on your slide, what you have there is a, a representation of Tiberius being smothered to death by Macro. This is unlikely to have been what really happened, but certainly it was, it was a nice story. And again, was hinted at the power of the Praetorian Guard 
to determine imperial politics. And we'll see this come up as a, as a repeating theme in subsequent lectures. So in Tiberius' will, he named two heirs. One was his grandnephew Caligula, and the second was his grandson Gemellus. Caligula very quickly asserts his own right to rule and gets rid of Gemellus. Initially, Gemellus is too young, and then he has Gemellus put to death. One of the advantages of Caligula, or Gaius as he is, is rightfully known, he's, he's known by his nickname Caligula, um, which meant little boots because he grew up in the army. His father was Germanicus, um, a great soldier who died prematurely, and Caligula wore the little boots, these sort of little children's military boots, um, when he was a child growing up on campaign with his father. He was a direct descendant of Augustus via his mother, Agrippina the Elder, who was a daughter of Agrippa and Julia, and then the son of Germanicus, this incredibly decorated and famous Roman warrior. So he had sort of the right genetics to be a good ruler. His sister was Agrippina the Younger, who's going to come back into our story as the mother of Nero. In general, the story of Caligula is one of somebody who got off to a good start and then just progressively seems to have gone nuts, um, that he somehow went off the deep end. He either just became infatuated with his own power, and that was the cause of his increasing autocratism. Um, it may have been, it's or speculated, that it was a reaction to his difficult childhood. His father was killed, possibly poisoned, when Caligula was very young, about seven years old, and his mother and his brothers were put to death under Tiberius. So Sejanus had launched an attack against them, and in fact they were put to death under Tiberius. So as a, as a fairly young child, he was front and center to the, vag the vagaries of imperial politics. It's also possible that he suffered brain damage. He had epilepsy, and at one point early in his reign, he became very sick with a kind of brain fever, and that may have actually caused brain damage, which led to serious changes in his personality. Initially, the Roman people were delighted. Um, they, it wasn't a concern that he offed Gemellus, um, the second co-heir. Nobody was worried about that. They embraced Caligula as being the son of Germanicus and also as being not Tiberius. And Caligula was very smart about distinguishing himself from Tiberius. He restored senatorial authority. He reinstituted spectacles, so did something that was going to increase his popularity with the people, but also in a very noticeable way set him apart from Tiberius. He created new courts to deal with the enormous backlog of legal cases that had come into practice because of Tiberius's absence. So when Tiberius was not in Rome, it was impossible to try certain kinds of legal cases that required the presence of the emperor. Um, and he would delegate that to some extent, but in general there was just a very slow legal process under Tiberius because of his absence and just because he was not increasing the number of courts to deal with the increased number of law cases. So Caligula does this, and so part of what this means is that people with minor complaints, my neighbor built a fence where he shouldn't have, or my neighbor stole my chickens, could now see those cases through in a relatively quick um, amount of time. He also distributed money, so another good way to win the favor of the masses, and he undertook new construction. Um, both building, some of it was finishing buildings that were still incomplete in the city of Rome, but some of it was also new buildings. And part of it was public works. In particular, he funded the construction of some harbors outside of Italy, that, but in Roman territory, that allowed for a much more efficient transport of grain, which again was a very important thing given the size of the population in Rome and the need to feed this huge number of people. So all things considered, Caligula did a good job. He recognized what needed to be done, he recognized how to consolidate his authority, and he made moves to do so. Um, on the left-hand side of your screen, you have here 
um, an obelisk. And this was actually, it's now in the Vatican. So if you ever go to St. Peter's, um, St. Peter's Basil Basilica, you'll see in the, in the forecourt, there's a, an obelisk there. And this, this is actually the obelisk that Caligula imported from Egypt. And originally it stood in a circus that he built, but now has, has found a home um, in the Vatican. Eventually, though, Caligula became more and more, not just autocratic, but outrageous. Um, he performed in public. He performed as a charioteer, as a gladiator, as a singer. This was seen as lacking in dignity. Roman elites were not supposed to be seen as actors. They weren't supposed to perform in public. Um, it wasn't great to do these things in private, but you definitely were not supposed to do them in public, and certainly not before the gaze of the Roman people. They weren't supposed to see you in that, in that mode. He dressed in the guise of various gods and, also, and did this in public, so in some sense mocking Roman religion. Um, it wasn't unheard of for emperors to pose for statues or other kinds of representations in the guise of a god, and you have an example of that in the cameo on the right-hand side of your screen. But to do this in public, sort of in a Halloween-y kind of way, was not acceptable. He deified his sister, another unacceptable thing. And finally, planned to make his favorite horse a consul. Um, this is partly getting because he got frustrated with the Senate, and so as a kind of end run, he said, you know, I'm going to take away one of the consulships and give it to my horse. So, in other words, seemed to be either just drunk with power or crazy. It's very clear that throughout his reign, he repeatedly panders to the people, but ignores the senators and the equestrians. So, makes a mistake that Augustus himself had recognized, you have to pander to both sides. You have to pander to the people, but you also have to make the Senate and the equestrians feel like they have a particip participatory role in the governance, in community. He doesn't do this. And this leads then to his assassination by the Praetorian Guard in 41 BC. And it's a, it's a great example, and we'll see this pattern over and over again in the Empire, that if you anger the Senate, um, if you anger the equestrians, so the Senate and the equestrians who are really the ruling class now in Rome, you're probably not going to last very long, that an assassination will be in the works and it's going to be tough to survive it. So here are some review questions. I'll let you press pause and go over these at your own pace. When you're ready to resume the lecture, you can do so. So after the death of Caligula, the empire found itself in a moment of crisis. There was uncertainty about what to do. He had not named an heir in his will. He had never given a share of Maius Imperium or tribunician power to anybody. His daughter was assassinated along with him. He didn't have a son. Um, he hadn't adopted an heir. So there was no clear successor in place after Caligula. And in addition, there was some energy in the Senate to try to restore the Republic. That there was a sense that, okay, things have been calm. Augustus has done his job. He has pacified the empire. We've now had a period, now a significant period, of peace and prosperity. The, Rome has recovered. It's now time to fully restore the Republic and with it the dominant role of the Senate. So. Some senators thought that they had finally ha found their opportunity to do so. They didn't anticipate, though, that the uncle of Caligula would step into this power vacuum, that Claudius himself would become the next princeps. He's named by the Praetorian Guard, but there's a lot of shuffling. There's a lot of, of movement um, before Claudius is able to really emerge as the only candidate. His brother-in-law attempts to seize power, so the, um, the brother-in-law of Caligula, that is. So his, one of his sister's husbands, um, who says, okay, maybe this is, my sister can claim descendancy and I will be the next princeps, um, and he has to be gotten rid of. 
Claudius himself was not an obvious candidate. Um, he, throughout the reign of Tiberius and Caligula, he had really remained in the background. He wasn't holding important offices. He wasn't serving in the military. He wasn't doing any of the things that one would expect of a princeps in training. He was a scholar. Um, he was trained by the historian Livy, in fact. And he seems to have had cerebral palsy. Um, he was lame, he was partially deaf, and if you've ever seen the series I, Claudius, you can see a, a um, representation of at least an interpretation of, of what Claudius was like. Um, but he's a, he's a complex figure um, because he didn't do sort of any of the usual things to become princeps, and yet is very successful not only in seizing power, but then in ruling Rome. And here you have uh, some coinage that is showing Claudius. And this is an, a painting that represents the coronation, as it were, of Claudius by the Praetorian Guard. And so the story goes that Claudius went off into the, the palace and hid in the curtains. And so the, the Praetorian Guard has found him, has opened the curtains, and declares him, this member of the Praetorian Guard, declares him emperor. But pointing at the sort of unwillingness of Claudius to put himself out there, that he wasn't trying to become emperor, but it was the Praetorian Guard that wanted him to become emperor. Claudius himself is often portrayed by ancient historians and even in modern representations as a bumbling idiot. Um, but what's unclear is whether he that was an act, or whether it was real. Um, one of the, the views, and this is one that Robert Graves takes, is it was a kind of mask that allowed him to survive the bloodbath of the imperial family under Tiberius, and that he seemed so unthreatening to everybody that they just ignored him as the scholar in the study. But the, one of the things that we see, though, is as soon as he is made print caps, he becomes quite ruthless in consolidating his power. He's not always as clever as he needs to be, but he's, in fact, quite a good princeps. He has no problem executing his rivals. Um, this includes his niece, Julia Lavilla, who's the sister of Caligula. Um, he really doesn't worry about um, this sort of normative practice. Bit surprising that you know he's able to move from the study to the imperial throne and act in this way. He very quickly undertakes a number of public projects to improve life for the Romans and, and more importantly, to gain the support of the people. He also recognizes, having been made emperor by the Praetorian Guard, given that Caligula, his predecessor, was killed by the Praetorian Guard, that it might be a good idea to weaken the powers of the Praetorian Guard. And he does so. He initially alienated the Senate. Um, who favored restoring the Republic after Caligula's assassination. So Claudius, interestingly, despite being a scholar, despite supposedly not wanting to be emperor, very clearly was not in favor of restoring the Republic. He wanted to continue the reign of the Julio-Claudians. Once he had consolidated his rule, he does then go back to respecting the views of the Senate. He makes a point of cultivating their allegiance. He consults them frequently during his reign. Um, he makes them feel important. He revives the office of censor, so there's now another office for various members of the senatorial aristocracy to hold. So he does make an effort during his reign, once he's consolidated power, to then strengthen the Senate. So weakening the Praetorian Guard, but strengthening the Senate. One of the interesting things about Claudius's reign is the role of freedmen. So we saw with Augustus that he turned to the equestrians as a kind of non-threatening but talented class of people who could serve in his government and do so effectively. For Claudius, it's the freedmen. These are people that had been former slaves but had been given their liberty, lacked a range of social rights, um, but now under Claudius, become in several cases quite visible in the imperial court. Um, these were people that had talent, um, and that's Claudius's point, is that he's not going to ignore the talent of somebody just because they come from a lower social class. This was 
a move that really angered the elites who felt like it was the privilege of the senatorial aristocracy to be the right-hand men of the emperor, not these, these freedmen. It also angered the equestrians who were being shut out of power at this point. Claudius expands the empire in some notable ways. So we had Augustus the expansionist, Tiberius consolidating, um, and Caligula essentially doing a little bit of each. He was a bit more um, sort of, uh, it's unclear what he was trying to do. Claudius has a clear expansionist program. He most famously invaded Britain, um, but also annexed a number of other territories. The advantage of this is that it expands Rome's tax base. So it's not just about a sense of world domination. It's actually getting people under Rome's control so that you can tax them. He regularized the grain supply in the winter time. So it was very difficult to get grain steadily to Rome in the winter. Remember that we're bringing grain from overseas. The shipping is closed during the winter time. The seas are too rough. There's too much danger. And so trying to make sure that you have an adequate storage ready to be brought to Rome in the winter time was a big challenge. And it's something that Claudius takes on to make sure that we don't have famines in the winter time in Rome. He also constructed another aqueduct, a new aqueduct, um, again, hinting at the fact that Rome's population is growing. There's a greater than ever need for water, for clean water. And he works on a port. So again, helping to the trade and especially the importation of grain. So doing things that were going to make life in Rome easier for the people. And clearly Claudius recognized the importance of these things. So he was able to have a pretty balanced program of military conquests abroad, but also public works at home. So here are some more review questions. You can go over these at your own pace, and when you're done with these, you're done with the lecture.